All right, so let's talk about the natural sciences versus the social sciences. First, for the layman, what is the difference? They both have science in a gag, come on. <laughs> right, so the lay, the lay person will often use these sort of simplifying heuristics to determine what is science versus not. If you're wearing a lab coat, if you have a petri dish, <laughs> right? If you have a couple of chemical formulas, that's science. Because to the average lay person, that's impenetrable. Uh, on the other hand, most people have, for example, a folk psychology. They have an innate sense of what psychology is. And therefore, to the extent that they feel that they could contribute, even though they might be lay people, somehow that's less impenetrable to them. Right. So they then will create this false dichotomy where chemistry and physics, that's real science. But sociology, you know, it's for people who couldn't hack it in, in, in physics. The reality is that the only difference is what are the phenomena that you're studying across these two general rubrics of science. In the social sciences, you're studying psychology, anthropology, uh, economics, sociology. It could be as rigorous as the natural sciences. So let me give you an example. If, you could, if you're a sociologist, you could study sociometry, which is, you know, for example, how does power diffuse within a network? And you could use very fancy mathematics, graph theory, to try to understand this. So the type of mathematical modeling that you would use to study how power diffuses within a network is actually a very uh, fancy mathematical approach. But sociology has somehow been co-opted by the activists, right? Yeah. And so we then view it as being less scientific. But sciences simply means adhering truthfully to the scientific method. I posit a hypothesis. I think about the data that I would need to collect that would either falsify or not a hypothesis. I collect that data. I apply some sort of uh, statistical analysis, some mathematical analysis to analyze the data, and then I go one way or the other. That could be just as applied if it's in economics or if it is in physics. So it is wrong, because I often get letters and emails from people asking me, well, is psychology really a science? I mean, of course it's a science. Yeah. I mean, well, ultimately, what is more laudable than studying the most important organism that we know called humans, right? Yeah. So, so it's not as though by the sheer nature of what physicists study, they are real scientists, but the sociologist is not. And by the way, I'm not trying to defend sociologists here because I often i am the one who's criticizing sociologists. <laughs> but right. usually I'm criticizing them for deviating from the scientific method. What makes them less scientists is that they become activists and not scientists. But you could be just as much as a scientist if you study something in business or if you study something in chemistry. Yeah, it's interesting that you talk, say, talk about activists, not scientists, because that's what I've been saying about journalists. These people are not doing true journalism and fact-finding anymore and reporting nice analogy, based on yeah. evidence. What they're doing is letting their own biases, biases slam right into the middle exactly. of this thing. And so for, so one of the things that uh, I will say differentiates the, sci the natural sciences from the social sciences, and that's very much at the heart of the work that I do, the natural sciences have organized trees of knowledge. So in physics, people agree on a set of core knowledge that at this point has become unassailable notwithstanding the fact that they still have the epistemic humility to say, oh, if new provision, it's only provisional. If something now falsifies it, I'm willing to revise it. Right. But there is- but, but the bedrock. The bedrock is yeah. there. There is core knowledge that is now unassailable in physics, in chemistry. There aren't chemists who are for the periodic table <laughs> and chemists who are against it, right, right? Right, Therefore, you could build coherent trees of knowledge or the term that I love to use, which was reintroduced into the common lexicon by E.O. Wilson, the evolutionary biologist at Harvard, is consilience, unity of knowledge. So the natural sciences, by the, by the nature of how they test theories, have these organized trees of knowledge. That's what's lacking in the social sciences. And the reason it's lacking is not because the social sciences are any less scientific, it's because it is easier for ideologies to creep into the social sciences, right? So if I'm a libertarian or a Marxist, I might study economics in a way that is very polluted by my right. personal ideology. So it's not that the social sciences are epistemologically any inherently less scientific than chemistry. It's that biases 
are easier to creep in. Yeah, it's funny because I'll hear, and I talk to sometimes, someone's a leftist economist or a libertarian economist or whatever it is, and I always think it's kind of funny, like we all have our own beliefs. Economically, I'm a little more libertarian these days, but if you're studying something within the window of the way you want it to be, it by default is gonna be a little screwy. Absolutely, and, and as I said, it, it is naturally more difficult for your personal ideological biases to come into uh, something that you're studying in organic chemistry. Although I should mention that there have been famous cases where even hard sciences have been deeply polluted by ideologies. So Lysenkoism, Lysenko was a, a, a Russian or Soviet Union uh, geneticist who proposed a theory of genetics that he thought was more in line with Marxist philosophy. That was a wrong theory of genetics that led to uh, massive famine uh, and to the death of millions of people. So even, it's not as though hard scientists are uh, inoculated from the possibility of being parasitized by some of these ideological biases. Do you think it's too late for the hard sciences to be protected? Like, is it too late for them to turn their force field on? Because we do see this creeping now in biology. I mean, Brett Weinstein's right. been talking about this now, that now it's really reaching its hand into that, it, which could have horrific repercussions for well, society. Well, listen, when, when, a, when a scientist in the 21st century, I'm speaking of myself right now, has to appear in front of the Canadian Senate <laughs> to argue that there is such a thing as male and female, yeah. and that evolutionary biology is based on the recognition that there is sexual dimorphism in human, sexual dimorphism is a fancy term for saying basically that there are evolved sex differences. Humans, men, males are bigger than females, right? That's a sexual dimorphism. So the fact that I have to appear in front of the Canadian Senate to actually argue these things right. demonstrates how far the snake has gone into the, the den. Yeah, so in a weird way, your position as a evolutionary biologist is, a, is sort of right at the front of the type of person that this ideology would attack, right? Just to correct, I'm, I'm an evolution psychologist. Uh, uh, psychologist, sorry. I, I apply no, evolutionary not biologist. biologist. I just said biologist, yeah. sorry. Although I apply evolutionary but, biological principles. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's craziness, right? And, and, and the reason why I'm so, if you like, aware of the, the epistemological dichotomy between the natural and social sciences is because my scientific career of 20 plus years has really been straddling both these fields, right? I apply evolutionary biology to study consumer behavior. Consumer behavior would be construed as something within the social sciences. Evolutionary biology is something that is within the natural sciences. So I really am very much steeped in both cultures and I see the extent to which it is easier for people to succumb to their personal biases in the social sciences. Let me just give you one example. Yeah. Uh, if you start off with the premise that you can't agree on whether there is such a thing as innate sex differences or not, how could you from that starting point ever build a tree of knowledge that's organized? If at this most fundamental level we can't agree that there is such a thing as male or female, then we're done, we're cooked. Uh, physicists don't suffer from that problem, and that's why they make much better progress than, than social scientists do. So as someone that studies marketing and why we behave how we do, what turns us on, what turns us off, all of that, in a weird way, you were, you were prepared for everything that was gonna happen politically right now and what's happening on the academic front because all of these things, they're all marketing in a way. Trump, it's marketing. Hillary marketed herself in a, in a certain way. So the trends were all there. Life is marketing. Yeah. So when people ask me, so what, what do you study as, as a professor of marketing? And I always answer them, everything yeah. you do in life is marketing. You market yourself on the mating market. We even use the euphemisms of the marketplace, right? You, yeah. you, you position yourself in the marketplace. You market yourself in the labor market. You market yourself to friends. You position yourself depending on whether you wish to belong to a group or not. Uh, animals communicate with each other, right? When, when animals advertise, for example, when the peacock, the peacock is literally engaging in conspicuous advertising. <laughs> so everything in life is marketing. So one of the reasons why I was very much interested in applying all of my training in marketing is because that's, I think, where all the sexy stuff is, right? We take all of these principles from psychology, from economics, from biology, uh, and then I apply them in areas that are of greatest import to most people. Is there something kind of scary about that, though, that it's not that the best ideas will necessarily win, it's that the best marketed ideas will win, and those often are not the same things. 
very good point. Listen, I'm, I'm right now working on my next book and I just connected with a, uh, what appears to be a wonderful literary agent. And he actually made this exact point. He said, look, what's really important as we move forward with your book <laughs> is how to market it. Yeah. Because there'll be people who will be very resistant to the ideas that you propose in that book. So again, everything is marketing. So basically, if you want to, so did Trump, do you think, have, not to bring everything back to him, but he must have had, I guess, as a businessman and putting his name all over these things for the last 30 years, he had an innate understanding of exactly what you're talking about. Absolutely. Well, listen, I could speak to one thing that he knew very well. He could completely read that many people, the silent majority, or certainly a sizable minority, if we're going to use the popular vote and all right, that, right. Uh, were fed up with political correctness and said, I'm going to be the anti-PC guy. And he bet pretty much everything on that, and it turns out that people responded to it, right? He could have equivocated, he could have been more careful with his words, but he sort of, he, he flies off the handle because he realized that the general atmosphere was most people, whether they're having chats on Facebook or at their workplace by the water cooler, at the university are tired of feeling stifled, are tired of feeling scared of the next syllable that they might misutter that might ruin their careers. And he said, I am the anti-PC warrior. And people responded to that marketing position. So as someone that studies all this stuff, what, what do you think pe- really drives people at the end of the day? You know, I, I mentioned before, as I say often, I think it's just a couple things. You wanna have a job, you wanna have some money, hopefully a house, maybe a family, maybe some sex, whatever, just right. the, ba- the basic stuff that yes. we all want. Do you think those are really just the, right. the underliers? So, so in, in several of my books, I actually answer that question in the following way. I map c- consumption acts onto four key Darwinian modules. So think about how Maslow's hierarchy, mm-hmm. if, you, if you know it. Yep. So at the basic level, there's the physiological needs and then belonging, you know, safety needs, belongingness needs, all the way up to self-actualization. Well, his theory was really based on his humanistic uh, philosophy. In other words, he had this bias, this, this ideological bias of how humans should be. Mm-hmm. It wasn't necessarily grounded in an understanding of biology. So I took this principle and I said, no, let's see what actually drives people based on biological principles. And so my four Darwinian modules are the survival module. So a lot of the things that we do are related to uh, our, our survival instinct. So our preference for fatty foods, right? Why is it that it's easy for us to succumb to uh, the dessert effect, having an extra piece of dessert when we've already had more calories than we need to? Well, that comes from the fact that our gustatory preferences have evolved in an environment of caloric scarcity and caloric uncertainty. So your taste buds and mine are vestiges of an environment long gone, but that we've evolved to have. But can your brain evolve to override that? Let me because, I'll answer yeah. that in a second. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's actually called the mismatch hypothesis. I'll come to it in a sec. Okay. So, so first we've got survival, then we've got uh, reproduction, everything related to sex. Why do men, why are 99% of Ferrari owners male? Because that's the form of peacocking. So the mm-hmm. peacock's tail is literally the Aston Martin that men drive, right? Yeah. And of course, both male, men and women engage in sexual signaling. So first we've got survival instinct, we've got uh, reproduction, then we've got kin selection. Kin selection is the mechanism that explains why is it that I would jump into the river to save three of my brothers? If all I care about is my survivability, why would I ever take the risk on them? Well, when you realize that, uh, natural selection operates at the, at the level of the gene, then saving three brothers, each of whom share half the genes with me, makes sense. Now you might say, well, how do you apply that in consumer behavior? Well, gift giving practices, right? So how I modulate the size of the gift that I give to different people turns out to be perfectly correlated to the genetic relatedness with each of these people. I give larger gifts to my brother than I do to my second cousin. I may not do this consciously. Mm-hmm. I may not know all these fancy theories when I'm doing it, but our brains have evolved to recognize that people are not of equal genetic relatedness. And the fourth module is reciprocal altruism. Okay, I jump into the river to save three brothers, but why would I jump in to save Dave Rubin? He's not my brother. Well, that comes from this evolved idea of tit for tat. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Well, today I might jump to save you with the expectation that tomorrow when I'm drowning, hopefully you'll come and save me. So this idea of reciprocity has evolved for social species. And again, it explains why I will invite you out for dinner when it's your birthday and you will hopefully reciprocate when it's mine. From a strict economic perspective, there's no point to this, right? Let's not invite each other, we'll be at the same final position. The reason why we do this exchange is to oil 
our friendship and our bond. Mm -hmm. So I argue that much of consumer behavior could be mapped onto these four modules. So now to your other question. Yeah. Uh, no, it is very difficult for our brain to catch up to a current reality. So for example, men have evolved sex sexual territoriality as a, as, a, as a strong element of their psychology, right? They don't like women to be uh, promiscuous if they're with them. Mm -hmm. they, get, they get sexually uh, uh, jealous if another man touches their woman and so on. Well, why would that have evolved? That goes both ways, right, for, it, uh, for men and women? Interestingly, okay, so that's okay. Okay, another premise. <laughs> interestingly, yeah. this, is right, not we'll, my, yeah. this is not my work. This is David Buss's work, a, a, a colleague, evolutionary psychologist at University of Texas, Austin. He looked at, with some of his colleagues, at romantic infidelity versus sexual infidelity. So he brought in people to the lab. He, he set them up with all sorts of physiological measures to measure their stress and had them read one of two vignettes. Uh, your, your husband right now is uh, having sex with the gorgeous secretary versus uh, your husband is developing an emotional bond with his coworker. She laughs at his jokes, they, they get along. So in one case, mm -hmm. you trigger sexual infidelity and the other one, romantic infidelity. Well, it turns out that women respond much more uh, adversely to romantic infidelity than to sexual infidelity and that effect is reversed for men. Hmm. Now that doesn't mean that women appreciate sexual infidelity <laughs> right. or are tolerant of it, but it's less so. Now what are the reasons for it? Well, it turns out that sexual infidelity is a profoundly important evolutionary problem for men because we're a biparental species where males invest a lot in their children. It doesn't make a lot of sense for me to invest for many, many years until little Johnny grows up to be sexually mature to then find out that it was the sexy Greek or Roman gardener who sired that guy, right? <laughs> Therefore, I evolved this, the, the psychological apparatus to try to protect against this possibility. So I am very intolerant of sexual infidelity. If a woman cheats on a man, it almost guarantees the end of the solution. The other way around, it doesn't. On the other hand, What's the greatest threat to a woman's interests? It's not that he has a sexual dalliance one time. This is why men very naively often will say, I just had sex with her once, she meant nothing to me. Right. They actually think that this is helping yeah. because there is no emotional bond between us. It's a one-time thing, right? On the other hand, if a man develops a emotional tie with a woman, that's a much greater predictor of him leaving the relationship. And that's why women respond so adversely to emotional infidelity. But if a man says, well, it was just a one time thing, isn't he then, let's assume it's the truth for a second, a guy yeah. does it one time, he's telling the woman what she wants to hear, right? I mean, what, what, if it's true for him, it's also what she does want to hear because she doesn't want to hear, well, it's oh, absolutely. It, it, it's certainly much better for him to yeah. say it was a one-time thing rather than I think I'm falling for her and we're planning on having sex another 37 times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he genuinely, honestly is trying to convey to her that she literally meant nothing to him. He's perfectly able to decouple the sexual act from any emotional investment, right? He, when you think about when Johns who go see prostitutes, what do they typically tell you? It's perfect unencumbered sex. Mm -hmm. I'm able to have sex with her and walk away. I pay for that walking away, right? So again, that speaks to evolved sex differences. This whole conversation that we've had might be transphobic systemic violence <laughs> under Bill C-16, because look, I didn't talk about the non-gendered or non-binary. Yeah. I well, must be a genocide supporter. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally, uh, but I'm glad you just mentioned that yeah. because as you're saying this, I'm not even exactly sure what my question is, but is there an element uh, as you're sitting across from a gay person that enters some of this Great stuff? question. Uh, I don't think we finished the mismatch question. Yeah, oh, okay, wait, yeah. let's get to that. L then let me we'll, finish yeah. that, then we'll, we'll talk about homosexuality. You're giving me a lot here, so I, well, it's, that's, uh, yeah. That's why I wanted to do the science. That's why we're it. here. Yeah, beautiful, thank you. Uh, so it, our brains don't catch up as quickly as we otherwise would want. So for example, the fact that, look, the top killers, the top medical killers, colon cancer, heart disease, diabetes, from an evolutionary medicine perspective, the argument is that it stems from the fact that today we live in an environment of plenty, mm -hmm. but our gustatory preferences have evolved in an environment of caloric scarcity and uncertainty. That mismatch between our current environment of plenty and the environment in which we've evolved causes some of these top killers. So to answer your question in a long-winded way, no, our brains don't catch up. If there were selection pressures for the next X number of years to cause 
an evolutionary trajectory to change, then it would happen. But typically, for even the most basic genetic uh, selection, it might take, say, 5,000 years. Right, so I guess what I'm talking about then is for the person that never goes for the dessert or never right. binges on this or that, that's not an evolutionary thing as much as it's someone that's aware, uh, it's, it's someone that's educated and aware of that these things can cause health problems. And you might be, like I live here in LA where everyone doesn't eat this or right. that or doesn't want gluten, Everyone's everyone has celiac disease, which <laughs> no one has celiac disease. Right. I mean, so that's not evolution, that's just sort of doing something different with the information you have, right? It's not on the macro level an evolutionary thing. Well, and sometimes you have multiple Darwinian pulls pulling you in different directions so that the net effect is zero. So for example, when I explain why there are evolutionary pressures for both men and women to cheat on their long-term partners, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that it's a fatalistic argument. It's not biological determinism, we're doomed to cheat. Because we also have evolved the moral calculus, right? Our morality, unless you're a religious person that thinks that it comes from God, our morality has also evolved through the exact same evolutionary forces that explain why we have opposable thumbs. And so, on the one hand, I'd like to very much cheat on my wife. On the other hand, I've got this moral calculus that stops me from doing. The net effect is that I might actually not do it. So, this speaks to a really important point, which is the fact that you explain something from an evolutionary perspective doesn't mean that it is biologically fatalistic. Got it, all right, so. Uh, homosexuality. Yes, now, if we add that into this mix that you're talking about here. So the, the top theory that has been proposed that has not, the data has not cooperated, comes from actually kin selection. So let me explain, it's a bit technical. Yeah. So, uh, you could increase your fitness. In other words, you could, you could extend your genes through direct reproduction. That's called direct fitness, right? If I have children, I'm extending my genes. But I could also, if you like, increase my inclusive fitness by investing in those who are related to me. When I, when I invest in my nephews, I am indirectly extending my genes, correct? Mm -hmm. So the argument then is that uh, Homosexuality need not be a Darwinian cul-de-sac, meaning a Darwinian dead end, because even though you may decide to not have children, by investing in your kin, you could still be extending your genes. Now, mm -hmm. how would you test this idea? Well, you would take, for example, homosexual uncles and heterosexual uncles and see if the homosexual uncles invest more in their nephews and nieces. And if the answer would be yes, then that would be one data point that supports the idea. I have taught my nephew everything I know about <laughs> Star Wars, and I am very so that proud. supports this kid the theory. knows everything, you know? Right, yeah. so, but the data has not supported that. So the bottom line is the top argument, the top evolution. Wait, the data has not supported, not supported that, that that actually happened? Exactly, in other really? words, the kin's the kin selection based argument for homosexuality, while at the theoretical level, conceptually speaking, so yeah. sounds good, yeah. the data has not supported that. Uh, so that's as far as I know about the nexus between homosexuality and evolution. Although, I think we might have mentioned this when you came on my show, I do have a current doctoral student who is actually planning on studying in his doctoral dis dissertation the intersection between, now get ready for this, homosexuality, evolutionary psychology and consumer behavior. Now, how is that gonna work? So we're going to look at phenomena that typically happen between men and women. Mm -hmm. and for example, if you go out on a first date, uh, the best way to never have a second date in the heterosexual context is for a man to be cheap on a first date. Right. That guarantee, and, and even if the woman is a billionaire, if he exhibits cues of frugality, it's dead, Yeah. okay? So then let's take this idea and see whether within the context of the dynamics of homosexual relationships, when, when two men go out on a date for the first time, mm -hmm. could we see a replication of this phenomenon? But now there isn't male, female here, so what would be the proxy measure, top, bottom? Yeah. So could, for example, your sex role as either a predominantly top or a predominantly bottom replicate the sex differences that we typically see at the interactions between men and women? What do, you, right. what do you think of that, by the way? Well, I don't know, it's so interesting because I don't know that your sexual position has anything to do with how you necessarily on a date would say I'm gonna pay or not pay. I don't, I, I get I get this, you're saying that basically the- The, the top, top is, 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 is mimicking of, the, the, the masculine. The, yeah, right, exactly. 
I, I get. I mean, I guess it's some. If, uh, that's what I would have guessed if right, you not said right. that. But I don't know that there's. So any we're going there. to test some. Uh, he, yeah. he, let's take another example of exactly this idea. Uh, so when when men and women mate, there's what's called assortative mating. So birds of a feather flock together. So typically women. It's not that women want necessarily tall guys, it's that they want a taller guy. Mm -hmm. So you just it's very rare for a woman to date someone shorter than her. So there's actually a study that was done with 720 naturally occurring couples. Only one of the 720 was the woman taller than the man. Right? Really? Yeah, it's a quite ex extraordinary rare. So let, now let's apply that to almost, now I haven't done the research, but here's my hypothesis. Yeah. I bet that the top bottom distinction will determine the height thing. In other words, if the, the bottom guy will be in a long-term union, in a, not a meeting in the, in the gay sauna for <laughs> quick sex, <laughs> gotcha. but, but a long-term pairing, a, a, you know, a marriage, uh, he'll be the shorter guy. So a lot of the phenomena that we would pick up from evolutionary psychology as applied to heterosexual context will replicate in the homosexual context. So I'm curious, all this being said, and as you said, you're, you're hypothesizing yes. about some of this stuff, and, and obviously your, your, <coughs> your student's gonna work on some of this, and other right. people are gonna work on some of this. Is there a complication that links everything else we've been talking about, where if you talk about gay anything, that this could get you in some sort of trouble? I, I don't sense you feel bad as you're talking about it, but and, that there would be some piece of this that you might find something that would lead you to somewhere uncomfortable or something? In the context of academia? Yeah, I don't mean you personally uh, right. uncomfortable, well, but I... I actually think that if you do any research right now on any of the LGBTQ things, that would be a very good thing because you would be somehow labeled as a progressive. Mm -hmm. So in the context of the ecosystem... Unless that you came to a conclusion that Oh, the conclusion want. that was not politically correct. Yeah. Yes. So that speaks to actually an issue that I've discussed with several folks, and I think perhaps maybe Sam Harris mentioned it when he had me on his show. He was asking me, is there any research that yeah. you would consider? And I to wanted be... to ask you this very same okay. question. Okay. Uh, so maybe we can get into that. Uh, and and the, the term that I had used with him then, which came from a paper that was published in Nature, forbidden knowledge. No, I am a strong non-proponent of the idea of forbidden knowledge. If research is done honestly, uh, assiduously, with a full adherence to the scientific method, then there is no question that is too taboo to, to ask. That actually speaks to something in philosophy, the difference between deontological ethics and consequentialist ethics. Deontological ethics is the following. It is never okay to lie. That's a deontological statement. A consequentialist ethics statement would say, well, it might be okay to lie depending on the consequences of the lie, right? right? If it's gonna cause 20 people to die. Exactly. So one is an absolutist perspective, one is it's a situational, it depends on the consequences. So I will use that framework to answer the, the forbidden taboo question of what kind of research is okay or not. Yeah. Uh, if you are a purist, a deontological epistemological person, I do research wherever it takes me, then you don't care about the consequences. If you are consequentialist bent, then you say, well, but if we do race differences and the results come out in a way that it could be used to harm a racial group, then we should stay away from it. I actually think that that's a profoundly dangerous position to take mm -hmm. because it's precisely this type of argument that led the social sciences to reject biology as being important. The, the, the early anthropologists, cultural anthropologists, who said biology doesn't matter for humans, were coming from an honorable place because they saw how Cretans could misuse biology, right? The Nazis can say, hey, there's a battle between the races, uh, it's a Darwinian struggle, we're Aryan, we won, who cares, uh -huh. let, let the Jews die. Uh, the British social class elitists said there's a battle between the social classes, the lower classes lost, screw them, it's a Darwinian struggle. Of course, this has nothing to do with Darwin, but because these folks misappropriate, misappropriated biological thinking, then the cultural anthropologists came along and said, let's get rid of biology uh -huh. because then nobody could misuse it. And now we're in the quagmire where we are today, where we have to appear in front of the Canadian Senate to argue that there is such a thing as male or female. So no, if you are a purist, you pursue knowledge wherever it takes you, unencumbered by the consequences. Is the problem that I suppose a certain amount of people, scientists included, probably think that they're purists, but actually aren't? You know what I mean? Like, so, so Mengele, 
probably thought <laughs> that, you know, who was doing all sorts of- You evil. went all Nazi on Yeah, me, right? I, I went Nazi. <laughs> I, in this particular case, I feel a Nazi reference is, actu okay, is, is actually sensible as okay. opposed to Nazi references that are thrown around right. all day long. But, but if, if you think about that, I mean, Mengele was doing horrific experiments on, on twins and just all sorts of things that were considered uh, b beyond imagination, horrible. <laughs> Um, probably believed that he was doing it for the good of truth and the good of science and all that. I don't, you know what I mean? Yes, like, sure. For, it, so he may have been a horrific person. I don't think he, in his heart, he probably thought he was doing good though, which right. is. So the only thing that I would say that would stop that from happening now is that we do have institutional review boards or ethics boards now that ensure that there is a boundary on the scientific pursuits that you could, well, pursue. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, you know, you can't frivolously harm animals. The way you treat them in the lab is important. You can't frivolously harm both physically and or psychologically human subjects, right? But interestingly though, now they've gone overboard. So the, the institutional review boards now have become so aware to want to be the antithesis of Mengele so that now if I ask you, what is your sex? <laughs> right, so. That could be traumatizing. If I ask you, what is your income? Well, wait, in some cultures, that's an affront and that could send the person into a tailspin of suicide because I asked him what his income is. And so now the most banal, innocuous questions have to be discussed for 73,000 years in these institutional review boards. So I think the fulcrum now swung too far the other way so that it is now stopping good science from being done because we are so afraid of harming any third party. Yeah. So the good intention of we actually don't want to harm this animal or we don't want to inject a dye into a human's eye that might blind them has become now we don't want to offend this person. Exactly right. This is a huge jump that's dangerous for science. Absolutely, and, and, and frankly, I see the fear in my graduate students when they're about to apply for uh, a thesis grant because they've heard all these horror stories and they come to me and say, Professor Saad, how long is the process going to take? <laughs> and I always answer them, it really depends on the makeup of the folks that are going to review your application. If they are perfectly reasonable people, it might go through in, in, in a session. If they are absolute maniacs, it might take us three months of rewriting this damn thing for some guy to finally accept that, you know, we're not injecting dye in people's face. And the reality is most of the research that I get involved in, although it's you know very rigorous and scientific, really has no downstream harm that's going to be caused. But it's unbelievable the types of concerns that people raise, and and we need to rail that, uh, rein that in a bit. Yeah, uh, I want to talk a little bit about robotics, which I've never even okay. mentioned the phrase robot to you or <laughs> any of that stuff. But there is something about we're we're getting into this time with incredible automation, and we know about you know cars that are driving themselves, and we know that uh, you know people iPads are going to put McDonald's employees out of business, and all of this stuff. How will that affect the way? We evolve. How do like now that we're going to add this thing that is completely artificial and outside of us? Right. Is there an evolutionary piece to that, or is that something else altogether? No, I think so. it's something because for evolution to to work, right? There there has to be a selection environment that is. If if I'm bored, let, let me for, for for your viewers who may not know how evolution works, let yeah. me explain it in, in three seconds. Okay, let, uh, you, uh, a male and a female get together through sexual reproduction, they have an offspring. This random combination and shuffling of genes results in their offspring having a blue dot here. If that blue dot is heritable, it could be passed on. And if that blue dot confers a survival advantage to the animal, then the selection pressures are in place for eventually that blue dot to become part of the makeup of that species. So to answer your question, you would have to explain to me how there are specific selection pressures that affect the survivability of an organism or its reproductive viability for me to be able to offer an evolutionary argument. Right now, I can't think yeah. of one. Does that make Fair sense? Enough. That that does make sense. Okay. I feel I can't end this on a question that we would say doesn't make sense perfectly, so <laughs> I will ask you this. Okay. And we're gonna do this many more times. You'll do this again? Anytime I'm here. All right. Um, Taking everything that we've discussed here, are you hopeful or not for the future of the West? Do you think we are just caught in sort of this leftist postmodernist stuff versus uh, a nationalism or a populism that could be dangerous? Or do you think that the enlightenment values that you care about and liberalism and all that 
actually has a chance to turn this stuff around. So here's now where I need to put on my marketing hat on. Yeah. Uh, as an Sell it, brother. Exactly. Sell if, it. If I'm going to speak about some of the times when I see the tsunami of ostrich thinking that comes my way, then I feel very pessimistic. I feel as though an utter disaster has to happen before people wake up. On the other hand, because I'd like to peddle hope and market hope, I think that it doesn't take too much to redress the ship. If enough silent people, silent voices rise up in every ecosystem, on Facebook, on the, in the media, in academia, at the bar, and actually the, you know, trigger the courage that is necessary for them to weigh in, I think that the voices, the enemies of reason will become marginalized. But we need to rise up. And that's why I always tell people when they ask me, well, what can I do? I say, well, you don't have to have the voice of Dave Rubin or the platform of Dave Rubin. You just have to have enough courage to take on your friends when you're engaging them on Facebook. When your professor says something that seems like it's an affront to reason, challenge him or her. Don't be silent. So I think that if enough people do that, then the ship can be redressed. If we remain apathetic, then I think we will lose. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And as I always say, I'm one guy that started a channel on YouTube. <laughs> You're one guy who started a channel on YouTube. We came from very different places. Yeah. And, and if our voices have done a little something, then there's plenty of other people that can Amen. replicate Amen, that Amen, brother. as well. All right, I think you guys know where his channel is, but if not, check out Gad's YouTube channel uh, at youtube.com slash gadsad.